is Savannah. Thank you so much for tuning in to our virtual field trips. I am one of the marine biologists and educators here at Clearwater Marine Aquarium. And today I'm going to teach you all about photo identification and the study that we do here in Clearwater with our wild resident fauna dolphins. So photo identification involves using high quality photography to capture unique markings and features from a wild population of animals. We use these markings to basically tell one animal apart from all the others, kind of like using a fingerprint for humans. So these markings are typically persistent through time, meaning they don't change. Um, a lot of animals in the wild have markings like these. So for example, uh, terrestrial or land mammals that are studied through photo ID typically involve giraffes using their spot patterns or uh, zebras using their stripe patterns. Clearwater Marine Aquarium actually studies three different types of animals or uses photo ID uh, for manatees, right whales, and for bottlenose dolphins, which I'll be talking to you about today. Now this type of research is widely used, as you can tell already, because it is fairly inexpensive. We are a nonprofit organization, so that's beneficial for us. And most importantly, it is non-invasive, meaning we can stay a safe distance from these animals with, uh, without harassing them and getting all of the information that we need. So like I said, their markings don't change too much over time. For dolphins, we like to use their dorsal fins, so we do see some changes, but some of these markings, like nicks and notches, you'll see with some of the animals here that we've cataloged, um, they are something we can monitor through time and basically use to tell who that animal is when we recite it in the wild. Now these markings are mostly natural, even though some of them look pretty severe. They can come from interactions with the dolphin's environment, their predators, and sometimes even one another, although there are a handful that we suspect are from man-made activities, which I'll go into more detail later on. Now we study dolphins for a few reasons. It's not just because they're really cool animals. We kind of consider that a bonus to this type of research. Most importantly, dolphins are indicators of the environment that they live in. So they typically tend to reflect signs of environmental stress or change in an environment if it is present. So we call these indicator species. There's actually many types of indicator species around the world, even right here in our bay. So we can basically look at the health of our bottomless dolphin population and see the health, hopefully, of all the fish and birds out in the wild, even maybe just the quality of the water itself. We can also use this information to help our rescue team. We are known as a working marine animal hospital, so every now and then we do need to help rescue these animals. Our team can provide insightful information to the rescue team, say they're monitoring an animal that they think they might need to rescue or just want to take a better look at it in the wild if they feel it's threatened for some reason. We can provide them information on things like site fidelity. That just means areas that this animal tends to hang out in. Therefore, it's an easy way to go and look for that animal and monitor it in the wild. Who it's hanging out with. Certain dolphins do have associations with specific animals over time, although some do not. Um, and also we can provide information on just like life history patterns that we see, uh, maybe who their mother is or other familiar relations that they have. So we can learn a lot about individual animals and their behaviors and what's typical to them through time. Now from there we can also learn a little bit about threats that these animals face. Clearwater Bay is a very populated area, so if there are needs that need to be taken to protect these animals, we have a good idea of where to start doing that. Now our team has been studying the wild population out here since 2013. These are only some of the many animals we've cataloged. We actually have over 170 individuals right now in the Clearwater Bay community, although our research extends much further, so we will be adding dolphins through time. The benefit to this type of research with bottlenose dolphins is that we consider these wild resident animals, which means that we see them either throughout the year, so we see every single day almost, just like probably here. And then there's some that we see um, maybe a couple times a year or only maybe a certain season through the year. And that's because these animals are not migratory. Instead, they typically have home ranges that they stick to. Some can be upwards of 50 miles. So those are those dolphins we might not see every single day. But some like Callie may only about five miles because we see her so persistently. All right, so now that we've learned a little bit about what dorsal ID involves, we're going to go on one of our research vessels and learn about what we do in the day.
three different zones, north and south of the aquarium. So we do attempt each zone out of three days of the week. During this time, uh, we may spend anywhere between four to eight hours on the water. This is gonna be dependent upon the amount of dolphins or sightings that we have. So every time we come across a dolphin or a group of dolphins within these survey zones, we will stop and then we'll spend up to 30 minutes with this group or this individual and we will document all of the information that we see. So during a sighting, there are three main roles. We typically have somebody navigating around the dolphin safely, so we'll have a captain up here in the tower. Um, they'll also be trying to help our photographer get the shots that they need. So the photographer has kind of a really big role, obviously. They're trying to get that dorsal fin. There are a couple of other things that we need to uh, process these photos in the future and to make sure that we're documenting as much of what we're seeing as possible because our photo ID team does go through these photos outside of the field and we need basically any evidence to prove what we saw. So things that we would want to document, not only include, again the dorsal fin, any important body condition. If we see an animal that maybe looks a little uh, skinny or maybe that one that looks really healthy or even just any markings that are questionable, we want to document that. Some of these scars can even help us uh, better catalog these animals over time if their dorsal fin doesn't have a lot of markings on it. We also want to note important relationships. So we'd want to document, if we can, a mother and a calf swimming together. That way when we're going through photos in the future, we can prove that that relationship exists between these two animals, especially if we're seeing a large group of dolphins together and they may be all over the place. The last position we have is our recorder. This is typically somebody who is going to actually have a really important role of making sure they're noting everything that the team is seeing during the sighting. They're also going to be looking at the weather conditions and the water conditions and taking, of course, those detailed notes. But behaviors are one of the easiest ways for us to understand how these dolphins are um, in terms of their health because we can't actually ask the dolphins if they're healthy or not. And again, that's going to be important in determining the health of the ecosystem. A little bit about markings earlier, um, and we're going to show you some dolphins that are obviously going to have a lot of markings and then some that don't have a lot of markings. Now markings, again, mostly form naturally over time through interactions with their environment. So dolphins often around this area hunt along artificial structures like seawalls. On seawalls, especially in Florida, but probably in many places around the world, things like oysters and barnacles tend to grow, attach and grow on these places. These provide important structure and habitat to a lot of animals, as well as food sources. A lot of those food sources that use oysters are the food sources for a dolphin, so they hunt along those shark oyster beds a lot. It doesn't really seem to affect the dolphins, even though they have a lot of markings, um, but it does, again, allow those markings to form over Another way that they may gain markings is through social interactions with one another. Dolphins are known for being really social animals. That's one of the main features um, that we use to better understand the population out here. And they often do rake each other. So raking is using their teeth to kind of mark each other up. We believe they do this kind of like play fighting like your dog or cat might do at home. A lot of wild animals display this type of behavior. We think that it helps them learn skills to better protect themselves if they were to come across an actual predator in the wild. Which leads to the last way a dolphin may naturally get their markings. So predator interactions, I'm sure a lot of you know that the number one predator of a dolphin is a shark. Sharks are notorious for having sharp teeth. So if they do come across a shark, uh, we do have a lot of shark bites on our dolphins that are healed, which means that they're probably not coming across big, big sharks that can affect them. But this shark may leave some markings and scarring on them. Now there is one other way that's uh, obviously really important that we know a dolphin can get a marking and that is through human interaction. So human interaction is any way a human interferes with a wild animal. It can be negative, sometimes in terms of a rescue, it can be positive. But most times with our dolphins out here, we'll see very unique markings, like a slice through the middle of the dorsal fin. It's a very clean cut and in a place that not many other animals tend to have a marking. We obviously aren't there with these animals when they get marked up, but we can allude to the fact that this is probably from a boat propeller. We also have some interesting scarring patterns that are very straight. And again, in odd places that may lead us to think they may be from an entanglement. Now we're gonna review all of the equipment that we use when we're in the field conducting dorsal ID. So we're gonna show you some of this equipment and then I'm gonna teach you about their function. So the first thing we're gonna talk about, probably the most important thing for us is our camera. 
So not only do you need a good quality camera with a large lens that can zoom into fine details like nicks on a dorsal fin, you also need a really good photographer, which I kind of talked about earlier. The photography for a dorsal ID, you have to be fast paced and kind of on your toes. You also need to know whether or not you got the right shot. And you need to know what to look for out there and those things that I talked about on the boat. But most importantly, it does take a lot of practice. It's not usually something you can just pick up overnight. So the next thing we need is our GPS. We need the GPS so we can mark locations for our sightings. Like I talked about earlier, site fidelity or habitat use that is common to these animals is really important in learning what is typical for these animals. Um, it can help protect them in the wild if we needed to, especially if they were threatened by man-made activities, but also again for those rescues. The next thing we'll talk about is something that a lot of people might not consider useful to this type of research, but a lot of teams use things like this to track environmental conditions. This is what's called a water quality parameter reader. So we can test dissolved oxygen, we can test the acidity of the water or the pH, as well as the salinity and temperature using this device. This is important again because dolphins live in the water we're studying the dolphins to monitor the health of the environment so this is just kind of to supplement that and now the most important way to document all of this is to write it down so that's what we do when we're out in the field these are just some of our data forms that we uh, write things down on first of all safety will actually let our marine department know where we're going and what we're doing for the day and who's going to be on board we have a log for all of the environmental conditions throughout the day we will write these down whenever we start and stop. And we'll also, of course, note everything in a sighting. We do record, again, all behaviors. We record which behaviors we saw the most. We write all of the notes down, the water condition, as well as the environmental conditions, like weather, wind, and like all of the water quality we just talked about. So hopefully now you've learned a lot about what we do as a research team in terms of our dorsal ID program. Now, the biggest thing I want to emphasize to you guys today is that we are permitted by the federal government to do this research, which means that unfortunately you can't go out in your backyard and conduct this type of research with wild animals. The main reason is we don't want to harass wildlife. Marine mammals in particular are protected under the federal government, under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So that involves all whales, porpoises, dolphins, and even manatees. What that means is it is illegal to touch, feed, or swim with these animals. Now that you've learned about Dorsal ID with me, you can take a craft home with you using the link in our webpage to make your very own dorsal fin. Thank you again for joining me today and learning about our Dorsal ID research program, and hopefully we'll get to see you again for our next virtual field trip.